Good morning and a very warm welcome to this, the seventh uh, annual uh, conference of the National Confidential, Confidential uh, Inquiry into Suicide uh, and Safety in Mental Health. I'm Kate Lovett. I'm uh, going to be chairing uh, this morning. I'm Dean of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and a general adult psychiatrist currently working in at Plymouth uh, in the South uh, West. This is the first ever virtual conference uh, for NKISH uh, and a very warm welcome to you all. We have almost 900 delegates who are registered uh, to be with us uh, today and we have a fantastic um, program uh, ahead of us. Um, if I could just mention a couple of housekeeping items before we uh, begin. Uh, the hashtag for today is hashtag NKISH2021. Uh, that's contained within your delegate packs and we'd encourage uh, those of you who want to to, uh, to tweet uh, using uh, the hashtag and use uh, social media uh, to its full uh, advantage. Uh, we're going to be taking uh, questions later on uh, in, the, in, the, in the morning uh, with a, hopefully a very rich uh, panel uh, discussion and I encourage people to uh, either email their questions, some of you have done that in advance, or um, today during the live session to use the question and answer uh, function please. Um, the chat uh, function is there for people who want to uh, introduce themselves uh, and network. We'd encourage you to do that. But for questions, please use the Q&A uh, function, uh, which will be um, monitored uh, by the, uh, the team at NKISH and uh, inform our discussion later on. So without further ado, I'd like to move on to our um, first speaker. And we're hugely uh, privileged to have uh, Steve Gilbert here with us uh, today. Uh, Steve uh, needs uh, no introduction. Steve uh, Gilbert, uh, OBE, works with a range of organisations uh, to develop policy uh, and scrutinise their programmes of work. He's currently helping to develop organisational anti-discrimination uh, approaches to better support uh, the needs of racially discriminated uh, communities. He served as vice chair for the uh, Independent Mental Health Act Review uh, and supported the chair in making recommendations to government and led work to improve outcomes for Black, uh, African and Caribbean communities. He's continued to work closely with the Department of Health and Social Care and the Ministry of Justice, uh, referred to as the Directors Group, uh, to develop the government uh, response to the Mental Health Act Review refining the key recommendations aimed at Black and African, uh, Black African and Caribbean communities. He's also a trustee for the Association of Mental Health Providers uh, and for MIND, representing people with experiences of mental illness and supporting work to reduce uh, racial inequalities. And today he's going to talk uh, from his own personal lived experience. So over to you, Steve. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you for inviting me to be part of the event. We all know that death is, is painful, uh, so much more when it's premature, life cut short. Suicide is devastating on so many levels. Contemplating suicide requires a person to battle with the strongest survival instinct. The fact that your whole body is designed to keep you alive. I've lived too many months in a state where I was convinced that I had to die and have lived that battle. If you were with me on the 25th of July in 2008, you'd have seen me sat on the bed in my room. I'd been crying, I looked scraggy, I hadn't eaten properly for well over a month. And sat next to me on my bed was my laptop. And the screen showed a website detailing things to consider before attempting suicide. It wasn't a pro-suicide website, it wasn't an anti-suicide website, it was just very, very factual. And the list goes something like this. Be sure that there is no alternative. Consider how friends and family will feel. Put all your bank statements into a folder to make it easier for someone to wrap up your finances. Select a method of suicide. Prepare the means. The most important thing on the list was to tell somebody what you intended to do. So I did. I called my best friend and I told him my plan. 
to give you some context, in the previous two months, I'd made two visits to my doctor's practice and I saw a different GP each time. I told them that I felt suicidal and was asking for talking therapy. The first time I was told, well, you don't strictly have a life-threatening condition, so there's no talking therapy available. The second GP told me that, well, in my experience, if a person is serious about taking their own life, they'd have done it by now. I'm not exactly sure what it is that my friend did or said, but later that day, I saw a crisis team and I had a mental health assessment. It was her actions on that day that saved my life. Unfortunately, I've also had two other significant periods of suicidal behavior and made a number of attempts on my life. In 2010, I had a manic episode and was sectioned. A diagnosis of bipolar disorder soon followed. The third of the three significant periods of suicidal behavior came in July of 2015. And I recall this conversation from the time. Sat there talking to Kathy, my best friend. I said, I don't think that I will become an old man. I think one day I'll just wake up and it'll be too much. And when that day comes, I want to have a plan ready for taking my own life. I was already planning. As I sat there at the breakfast table, I was fastidiously studying methods for suicide. My aim, finding a method that would guarantee my death. In late 2015, I was then diagnosed with a secondary diagnosis of complex PTSD, a direct result of adverse childhood experiences. Turns out I'd been subjected to psychological abuse by my parents. For context, I'm biracial. My mum is white and my dad is black. My dad was born in the UK, my grandmother Jamaica, and my grandfather is from St Kitts. On my father's side, there are at least three of us who've been sectioned, including my father, and two repeatedly and for extended periods of time. Now, in terms of my family member experiences of suicide, I honestly have no idea. Serious mental illness has destroyed my relationship with my family. Back at the time when I was in contact with them, and despite the prevalence of mental illness in my family, we didn't talk about it, not really. So when it came to suicide and those powerful thoughts, I didn't even know that people who looked like me considered suicide. It didn't fit with the image that I had of strong, proud, black men and women. Now I've been working in suicide prevention for the last five years. And the issue of ethnicity has routinely been neglected, and there are many reasons for this. But the events of the last year have highlighted, beyond any doubt, the need for our society to understand the experiences of people from Black, Brown and racialized communities much more deeply, and to consider how the colour of a person's skin impacts access to, experience of, and outcomes within health and social care. And I really welcome today's report as an important step in understanding suicide in our communities. The next bit's really anecdotal. For as many years as I've been involved, uh, the past five years, I think, I have attended um, the National Suicide Prevention Alliance's annual conference. Hundreds of people go. I count how many people there are that aren't white. And it's not many. And I said, that's really anecdotal. One of the other things that really sticks in my mind is I, I've had the real privilege of working with the National Suicide Prevention Alliance over the past year to develop a lived experience training program. We've taken people with both experiences of bereavement and those people that would identify as being suicide attempt survivors. And we have developed a training program to really equip them to work in the sector, to be able to influence policy and to use their experiences to benefit others. Despite our best efforts, we failed to have anybody within the three cohorts numbering 23 people who were not white. Anecdotal, but 
really quite difficult to accept that even when we're in the room and, and we're trying to make decisions that there are so few people who really understand the experiences of black, brown and racialized communities. I want to share very, very quickly what I think might have happened at those three significant periods in my life. If we go back to 2008, that was my first time experiencing suicidal thoughts. I was incredibly scared. I had no idea what was going on. And it felt like my suicide was inevitable. And as I said, I was only stopped by my friend's intervention. In autumn of 2009, this is the second period, I had huge degrees of guilt. I'd received care the year before. I'd seen a psychiatrist. I'd seen a nurse. I'd had medication. And yet still, I felt suicidal. This time, I wanted it to look like an accident. I didn't want my best friend to feel that she'd failed as well. And then in the summer of 2015, this was ultimately probably the most scary period of my life. There's no fear there at all. I'd become okay with the idea of dying. And from my last two periods of suicidal thoughts, I now know things that no one should know. And I can never, ever forget them. This time around, I didn't really have to think about method. I already knew ways that I could take my life. What I think this speaks to is the need for our suicide prevention approaches to really understand and really deal with people who had not just their first experiences, but someone that's lived through multiple experiences of suicidal thoughts. So what do I think would have helped? Well, I've got a quite simple list. Compassion, information, and a safety plan. Regardless of whether or not you are old, young, rich, poor, the experience of needing to go and seek help for life-threatening thoughts is never an easy one. I lived a really short distance from where I lived to the surgery, and I would go down and I would stare at the door and then I'd run home. This happened three or four times. Then I managed to make it up the ramp outside so that I'd be stood in the doorway. And again, I'd run home. Then I'd finally muster the strength to make an appointment only to be met with the receptionist. The first time I didn't even make it all the way through making the appointment. A few days later, and I finally managed to make the appointment. I was slightly early and the GP was running late. And I sat there in the waiting room, stopping my eyes out. I truly never felt so bad in my life. And then I've got to go and tell somebody pretty much immediately, within 10 minutes, the most disturbing and destructive thoughts that I have ever experienced. And then to be told that there's no help available. Information. Both times, and again, I accept that this was quite some years ago, that I was sent away with not so much as even the number for Samaritans. But it's really important to understand that even a printed leaflet or something printed out on a sheet of paper is more than just information. It lets you know that you're not the only person that's ever felt like this. I didn't know that suicidal thoughts were a thing. And even as much as we discuss it in society, the word suicide and what we're experiencing, there might be a dissonance there. There might be a disconnect. Actually telling somebody that they're not the only person that's gone through this is vitally important. And the third thing is to create a safety plan. Let me know what's going to happen. Let me know what the steps are. Let me know what I can do to keep me safe. Let me know what things friends and family can do to keep me safe. And please let me know what you as a health practitioner will do to keep me safe. So to wrap up, I want to end with this thought. This summer, hopefully, we will see the world's greatest athletes complete in the Olympics, an event which I've always loved since childhood, but an event which, as of 2008, always takes on a significant meaning for me. It was in the summer of 2008, when at my lowest, that I genuinely believed that I deserved to die. I sat alone 
in my dressing room, curtains closed, and I watched as the athletes competed, and Usain Bolt was announced to the world. As I said, I hadn't eaten or slept properly in well over a month. Watching the Olympics was the only thing keeping me going. I planned to die when the game was finished. The only thing that kept me alive at that point was the unwavering support of the most amazing person in the world. And I thank God every day that Kathy was there and that she insisted that I stay alive. Memories of that summer are still incredibly difficult to face. I still question how I got to the point of wanting to kill myself. But as difficult as this reminder is, I choose to celebrate my survival. I am a suicide attempt survivor, and I believe that that is worth celebrating. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Steve, for opening uh, the conference and for your words of experience and uh, wisdom uh, and very clear um, uh, direction about what you needed, compassion, information, and a safety plan.